You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, presented by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. I want to be the title sponsor. What's it going to cost? I think around 10 million. Yeah, I, I, that's a bit out of my budget. I have the impression that we are in the place where we have to be now. Greg had a really bad back all last week, so we caught up on your podcast with really? me giving him a back massage and him listening to you guys. Oh, that's, that's a wonderful image. <laughs> with exclusive interviews and the best analysis on two wheels, this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Daniel Freib. Hello, chaps. And Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Now, Lionel and Daniel, we've got a, an unusual podcast this week. Uh, you're going to hear a, an extended conversation that Lionel had with Ross Tucker and Jeroen Swart, both sports scientists, both strangely based in Cape Town in South Africa. Jeroen Swart was the sports scientist involved recently in the Chris Froome physiological testing at the GSK lab in London. Uh, Ross Tucker has been quite a loud voice on social media and on his own website, Science of Sport, in the whole debate and discussion around physiological data, power data, basically, um, as it relates to doping suspicion, etc. So we thought we would get the two of them talking together because there are points that they there are points that they have agreed on in in in, in terms of the the Chris Froome data, and there are points on which they appear to disagree. So. Lionel, you conduct the interview. I'll get you to introduce it in a moment. The three of us will come back at the end of, of this part one of, of, of this conversation because we're going to play it in two parts. Part two will be released later in the week, um, but part one will come up today. And we'll come back at the end and contextualize it a little bit, the, the discussion, and talk a little bit about some of the points raised. But Lionel, can you introduce it? Yeah, well, this is your own Swart and Ross Tucker, both sports scientists. They know one another in real life, not just on Twitter. Um, and they were together in one room in uh, South Africa. And I was in my office at home conducting this conversation over uh, Skype. So um, I started off by asking the pair of them to introduce themselves and explain a little bit about uh, how they both became to be such key components of this debate about Chris Froome and his power output. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney and Daniel Freib. Yeah, I'm uh, Ross Tucker. I'm a sports scientist living in Cape Town. I did a PhD studying fatigue and the limits of performance. And I was then at the university for a number of years. I've now moved on and I consult to high performance teams and organizations main one being world rugby so not directly in cycling but I've obviously been following the tour for many many years um, and Juan and I met when he came to the u university also to do his PhD and so we've had that in common since 2000 and when was it? 2003. Was that when yeah. you came? To 2000, 2003 so there you go so we go back 12 years almost and yeah have a common interest in cycling. From my side, uh, I'm, a, I'm a medical doctor. Um, following my uh, undergraduate medical degree, I decided to race uh, professionally as a cyclist, mountain biking, and, uh, and race the professional scene for uh, two and a half years before realizing that I wasn't going to make it uh, at the highest level and uh, came to uh, the Sports Science Institute in UCT to do my PhD and also happened to do my PhD in the nature of fatigue. So uh, Ross and I have very similar uh, PhD backgrounds in that respect. And uh, I still work uh, very much in, in, in high-level cycling, uh, working with many top uh, international athletes like uh, Ashley Passio, uh, the late uh, Barry Stunder, uh, John Lee Augustine in the past, and a number of other uh, top road and, and mountain bike professionals. And um, yeah, so I, I fairly well, well versed specifically in cycling, and, uh, and that's my background. Your own, if I can ask you first of all, can you explain how it came about that you were in the Glaxo Smith Climb laboratory with Chris Froome and uh, Richard Moore and a lot of other people um, testing Chris Froome's physiological capabilities? Yeah, so uh, Chris and I met uh, in 2011 after his breakout performance at the Vuelta, and he was doing a, an interview on the Super Cycling Show, which is a a weekly cycling uh, segment here on on primetime television or satellite television uh, and um, I happened to do a, a segment there uh, regularly uh, where people could phone in and ask me questions and so I happened to be in the studio at the same time as him 
and we, you know, while we were waiting backstage, we, we struck up a conversation and, uh, and, and stayed in touch, basically, uh, by, uh, by text and phone calls subsequently. And uh, over the subsequent years, uh, I, you know, he's, he's, he's called me and contacted me a couple of times just when he's had specifically really uh, injury-related problems and required some expertise, uh, you know, following, uh, following those issues. And, um, and obviously Chris does have some idea of being, you know, based in South Africa of, of my uh, background and expertise. And um, we, we've never really discussed anything performance-based or physiology-based until during the middle of this tour, uh, I was contacted uh, and, and asked whether or not I would be interested in doing the testing on him. And, um, and it, it, it evolved from there. So um, to, can, I think probably uh, 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 there, there'd be some interest in the background of, of the testing itself and how we landed up at, at GlaxoSmithKline and how Richard Moore got involved. Um, but essentially, when they asked me, I said, uh, look, I, I'd be interested in doing it, but it's very important that, first of all, that we have somebody who's not a scientist uh, there who can also... Uh, validate uh, the you know the, the the transparency in terms of the entire process. So in other words, be uh, you know in, involved in all of the uh, communication in the lead up to the testing in terms of the emails and uh, the protocols that we would employ. And uh, at first, we actually approached David Epstein, um, who you obviously know, and he's been involved in in in, in many similar types of uh, investigative research. Uh, uh, journal, journalism work um, and he unfortunately couldn't uh, take part and so um, we eventually settled on, on Richard who was available and interested in, and, and it actually from a logistics perspective worked out well uh, for him. Um, in terms of the laboratory um, we wanted to use a laboratory that had the, the equipment that we required, uh, knowledgeable staff and uh, we looked at first for a, a laboratory in Monaco and unfortunately, we couldn't really find something suitable there. And then in terms of the time constraints, uh, it, it got to the point where we were closing in on the Vuelta and wanted to get this uh, done before the Vuelta because after the Vuelta, it was unlikely that Chris would be interested in or, or delivering on a really high-performance test because the athletes obviously got to be motivated. And so uh, we, we were running out of time, and so we settled on uh, on GSK because they they were close to the airport. They had all the expertise. They had all the equipment. Chris could fly in from Monaco. I could fly in from Cape Town, and uh, and from that perspective, it it, it uh, was a really suitable laboratory. And uh, I think the guys there have done sterling work in terms of uh, doing the actual tests and and also being involved from a science perspective in analysing the data. So, as a scientist, then, um, what what was it that uh, appealed to you about being uh, a witness to these tests? And, and were you happy with what they've achieved? I mean, we've seen quite a lot of the reaction. Um, do you feel that this has really moved things on in terms of people's understanding of, um, you know, whether or not, um, you know, Chris Froome is a, 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 an athlete who's competing and winning the Tour de France clean? Yeah, I think, I think we should get Ross involved in this point in the discussion as well, because this is the first pertinent question, is what did we achieve with the testing? And... Um, so, uh, the, the, the firstly, to answer the question as to what I, I, I was hoping to get out of it is, we've got so little data uh, on these t sorts of athletes in terms of athletes who have either won the Tour or, or are very close to winning the Tour de France and their unique physiological attributes. And so, uh, for me, the interest was obviously in doing the appropriate uh, physiological tests, which would you know give a broad-based physiological profile of, of, uh, of an athlete at that level. I didn't ever expect the results to um, provide us with any uh, definitive evidence for or against the use of performance enhancing drugs. And I said it before the test, and I, I, th I think I've said it a couple of times after that. The, the, the nature of those tests was really to dispel this notion that what the athletes are doing on some of the climbs are what we call super physiological in other words uh, not ca uh, possible within the, the the bounds of normal human physiology and i think we've qu quite clearly uh, shown that that that's the case um and uh, just to reiterate you know you can be a mediocre or 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 reasonably high level athlete and dope your way to a higher level 
uh, or you could be super talented and not have doped and achieve the same results. The, the, the data doesn't tell us whether or not there's any use of performance enhancing drugs. But it could, sorry, just the, the third scenario is if you're super talented and you're doped and you went so high up that it did look absolutely implausible, then that scenario could exist. But you already knew it wasn't going to because we had historical comparisons from the race. So the, the, the testing as a once-off was never going to deliver the conclusive evidence that people wanted it to. So in that regard, if the objective of having that testing done was to provide that evidence, it was always going to not meet people's expectations. And I think a big part of the problem subsequent to the release of the data has been false expectations in both directions. The one that it would prove doping and the other one that it would disprove it, that was never going to happen. So it was always, for me, a strategic move and a public relations move rather than a scientific uh, biological passport type doping test. That was never the standard that it should have been uh, set, but unfortunately was. Yeah, I, I, look, I, I, d I disagree with you about the PR exercise. I think there was a call for him specifically to have a VO2 max test. I mean, Fred Grupper... Some did, yeah. Yeah, Fred Grupper, for instance, um, was, was, you know, given his data, uh, longitudinal data, and that's the power files all the way back to, to uh, 2011, and uh, he, had, he had access to those, analysed those, and came back and said, you know, the only missing piece that I would really still want to see is a VO2 max test. So, you know, and, and, and from other... Uh, uh, you know, individuals. There were similar calls for a VO2 max test. I think uh, what from from Ross and from my side, I think it, it, we were quite both. Uh, what we're iterating now is that we were quite clear that uh, you know, based on the uh, predicted VO2 max is required for the efforts, uh, I wasn't expecting to see anything uh, out of the ordinary, and and I think Ross has just uh, it reiterated that. But it has at least you know given those that called for a VO2 max test, that data. And secondly, I think there's, you know, the odd outlier in terms of individuals screaming about performances of 7 watts a kilo or more on the climbs based on their own, you know, uh, algorithms for predicting performance and, you know, other calls like Antoine Weyer saying that, you know, every single performance was extraterrestrial or, uh, you mutant know, abnormal or, or mutant or, or Pick whatever. Pick your euphemism. Yeah. yeah. And I think... In that respect, it's it's clearly shown that that's not the case. These are not outside of of of, of normal physiological limits. The question uh, is is whether at that particular moment, that particular performance is in keeping with you know what we understand to be the effects of fatigue on an athlete at that point in the tour or that late in a stage versus what they can produce in a laboratory. So I suppose this is a question for both of you, but Ross, first of all, do you believe that there is a red line um, somewhere that basically says any performance beyond this must be doped? And if so, where is that? I mean, if we, given that we don't have very much data on um, Tour de France champions, is it possible to say where that line actually falls? And, it, and, and even if it was possible, um, you know, is it not possible that improvements in, you know, a large number of factors, equipment and training being two of the um, two of the biggest factors, could mean that that line could be stretched in the future anyway? Yeah, it'll move with those factors for sure. I mean, I, if you were to use a, a color system like green as a highly plausible, physiologically possible performance and red lies beyond the line, it's not like we suddenly go from green to red. There's a zone of, let's call it orange in between. And I think it slowly bleeds towards that. So I'd be hesitant to say there's a line that one can draw. I mean, I know it was six years ago that I um, first started doing some analysis in the tour because what had happened then was Contador had won a stage, I think it was on the Verbier, and Greg LeMond said that based on the performance uh, estimates of Contador's ride that day, he would have had to have a VO2 max of uh, 99 mils per kilogram. Now, that is highly <laughs> implausible. And so I got interested in it for that reason. And, and the, theoretically, you could actually set a limit and you could say that the implications of certain performances are absolutely inconceivable for all known physiology. But no, I, could, I couldn't tell you that there's a specific line. I mean, if I saw, if I saw Marco Pantani maybe in the 90s riding at 6.8 or 7 watts a kilogram for 40 minutes at the end of a tour, like I'll be calling shenanigans on that with a very high probability of being correct in the same way that if I saw 
a 100 meter runner sprinting at uh, 8.9 seconds, I'd be saying something's wrong with this picture, you know. So, so there's there's a there's an extreme, just outrageous point when it becomes obvious, but the the Im, the clarity, like of coming back from that obvious point, when do you start to say, okay, now it's plausible? There's there's no single point where that'll exist, unfortunately. You know, can if I can add to that, there's the other aspect in terms of the the. the critical power concept, so, and also where these performances happen, for instance, in which stage and, and, and the nature of the stage. So, you know, run, running is very different to cycling. If you look at, a, for instance, a, a marathon race, the runners are going pretty much at the same pace the entire duration of, uh, of a run. Uh, cycling is very different in that, you know, the preceding, uh, you know, climbs or, or, or mm. pace in that stage determine how fresh or fatigued you are when you reach that final call and, and have to ascend that call. And so that also has a big impact on the performance on the day. And uh, the other aspect to it is the duration of that performance. So critical power is basically a, a curve where the, the power output that you can sustain for a particular duration is plotted. And, and to, sorry to get a bit technical, but... Uh, what what it looks like is a is a, uh, a biphasic distribution. In other words, it starts off pretty flat, it drops off uh, steeply over time, and then it sort of plateaus out again at the or, or tapers off towards the longer durations. And so you've got to take into account the duration of the climbs. And if we look at the the performances in the heyday of the doping era, so we look at the the the, the one really the, the guy we know who doped uh, maybe the best, or maybe. According to him, he, he was he was on a par with the other athletes. But Lance Armstrong's performances, if we look at his time trial up Alpe d'Huez, and we look at that performance, that was 37 minutes. And if we if we look at the same estimates of performance, we get a, a peak power you know power to weight ratio for that performance of 6.37 watts a kilo. Now, if you look at the critical power model, someone who does a 20 minute performance, which is roughly half that, would be able to produce approximately 7 percent higher power output. So we should expect for a 20-minute performance a significantly better performance than we do for something uh, that's taking 40 minutes to produce. And if we look in at, so if we take Armstrong's 6.37 watts and we project that down to 20-minute uh, efforts, you know, we'd be looking at a, a performance of 6.7, 6.8 watts a kilo for 20 minutes. And in the, la in the last few years, we've seen nowhere near that. What we've seen is some very good performances over 20-minute climbs and we t take, for instance, uh, Froome's performance for X3 domain, where he did you know, a, a predicted performance of just under 6.3 watts a kilo. Now, if you take Armstrong's performance at Alpe d'Huez, which happened in the final week of the tour, or was it in the late in the second week? I can't recall exactly when the, the Alpe d'Huez time trial was. That's approximately 7 or 8% percent better than Froome's best performance to date. So that's a really eyebrow-raising performance. And you know, we know from... Uh, the VO2 max tests that Armstrong did that, you know, in his, in his 2005, 2000, or sorry, 95, 96 uh, period when he did VO2 max tests, he was producing you know, a VO2 max of 75, which is good, but not phenomenal. It's not tour winning sort of material in terms of what you do on a, in a laboratory. And so, you know, what, uh, what happened between then and winning the tour, we now know to be a good deal of doping. And that's what elevated him into that stratospheric level where he was able to produce those performances but in comparison to today's performances it was still a good step higher than what we're seeing these days so a really talented athlete who's got a vo2 max in the mid 80s should be able to produce performances that are maybe not as good but not that far off that and so you know that's those are the types of contexts we have to put in the performances i hope that all made sense it, it does it does as um scientists though i'm i'm sort of trying to divorce the assessment of an athlete in a laboratory um test where the con the elements can be controlled and the readings can be measured much more accurately against um out on the road in the tour de france where there are so many different factors do you think it's fair to assess performances based on um you know taking a at stopwatch and watching television footage um, when there are so many different factors to take into account, not least um, two riders may well arrive at the bottom of the climb having undertaken a lot more work. You know, Quintana and Froome, just to use two examples, 
may well have ridden the first three and a half hour um, of the stage, you know, in a very different positions in the bunch. One may have had a, a puncture or, you know, a crash and had to expend energy um, chasing back on. One may not have been as good at riding out of the wind. And then when you get onto the climb, there are so many other different factors, road surface, um, just even down to the line that a rider might take around corners, which might mean a difference of, you know, you know, I don't know, over a 15 kilometer climb might make a difference of, of, of 100, 200 meters. I, I'm, I'm speculating, obviously, there. But there are so many factors that can't be measured. And yet, when the calculations are produced, once they're in black and white, they're taken by um, a, a wider audience as, you know, marks that are set in, set in stone, really. Do you think that there's some, something slightly irresponsible about the science behind that? doesn't mean because if you use common sense then you can you can account for many of those things so in that case with Le Mans the the, the Verbier climb I seem to recall had a tailwind pretty much the whole way up and you could make adjustments for that and the analogy I used was that if if you're if you're completely blind and someone offers you partial sight of say 20 percent it doesn't mean you have to disengage your sense of hearing and touch and feel and so on you can you can just add one to the other so my my viewing of it is that if you are sensible about it, and, and I will say that there has been a great deal of sense lacking in the discussion in both directions, then you can start to offer people a more clear picture than if you just kept your eyes tightly closed. You wouldn't want to make an entire assessment based on what is clearly partial vision, to continue the analogy. So I think people just have to be a little bit sensible about it. And then the other thing is you don't do it once off. It's uh, that's looking at one pixel in an image and deciding what you're looking at. So if you can gather many pixels over a prolonged period, then you would be in a p better position to start understanding that. I I think that if you did that and you looked at it longitudinally and comparatively, which is how the physiology and the performance should be looked at, in my opinion, so that you can start filling in the context, which is really what you're talking about, then the data that you add or measure starts to have meaning whereas if you look at it only as data then you are in danger of that and I think I think that would constitute bad science so I don't I personally find it uh, uncomfortable at all to be venturing into what is unknown because I'm happy to deal with probability and uncertainty with a little bit of common sense behind it I think I think you've hit the nail on the head there, and that that is a, a common sense approach. And I think that's where a lot of the, the problem arises. Is that I think Ross and and and, and other scientists who've been analysing the performances, I, I think we've clearly validated that the the predicted performances are pretty accurate. I mean, the the published data from other riders in comparison to what the predicted values have, have come back as uh, seem to be very very close. So. You know, the, the, the power outputs that are estimated, I think, and a lot of people jumped on it and said, oh, they're not accurate, and, and, and I, I disagree. They are accurate. What they mean is really the question. And, and what you referred to earlier on, Lionel, is having these cutoffs where, you know, suddenly somebody produces a performance and immediately there is a small vocal group that jump on that and, and claim that that's clear indication that, that uh, the riders used some performance-enhancing substance. And that's what we've got to get away from, I think, uh, you c and as Ross pointed out, is it, it's just a pixel, and it doesn't tell you the complete picture. And there are, as you pointed out, Lionel, so many different factors that can lead to a specific performance. And Pearson Martin, we, for instance, if we look at that, that was the first climbing stage of the tour this year. It came two days after a rest day. The lead-up to that final climb was pretty much dead flat. We've got data from MTN Quebec's Jean Jacques Janssen von Rensburg, and he averaged under 140 watts for that stage before he hit the climb. And he's not the, you know, Louis Manchis was the protected rider in that team. Um, so, uh, you know, Chris probably would have had a, an even lower average power output. And frankly, you know, anything under 140 watts average in leading into that climb is pretty much just a warm-up ride. It's a free so that's a massive, massive, uh, uh, you know, just once-off effort coming off very little fatigue. First week of the tour, two days after rest day, very easy run into the to the final climb. Then you're going to expect to see a, a phenomenal performance. And just over 20 minutes, I think the climb was 23 minutes, and he averaged uh, you know close on 6.3 watts a kilo. That's credible 
you know, if, if, if a rider, and, and this is obviously, we don't want to put sperm cutoffs, but if I see 6.3 watts a kilo for 40 minutes in the last week of the tour, that's going to raise my eyebrows. And likewise, you know, something over 20 minutes, it's over 6.5, 6.6 watts a kilo, that's going to raise my eyebrows. That's not, I don't want to draw a line in the sand and say, oh, that's definitely doping, but I would certainly sit up and take notice then and say, wow, that's, that's something that we really, you know, uh, haven't seen. Uh, for uh, you know, since Armstrong's uh, dope days, so um, the context is very important, and uh, you know it brings us back to really longitudinal data and and looking at the data over a period of time. So uh, that's probably something that we should lead into the next topic, which is you know the the, the transparency and, and and release of longitudinal data. Yeah, but I just the thing to add to that is we're having this discussion today, and like unfortunately half of it is hypothetical because. As much as we can make estimates about what Pantani and Reese and Ulrich and Armstrong and, and the guys were doing in the 90s and then subsequent in the 2000s, we're still making estimates. Imagine we had that power data. Then we'd be in a much better position to say the tour in 2015 looks different to the tour in 2003, looks different to the tour in 1996, for instance. But the thing is we don't, right? So we've got two, two ways to approach that. We can say, well, we don't have it, so we're going to stop this exercise. Or we can say, let's do the best with what we've got right now and make sure that in the future we do, so that in 2025, when the guy's winning the Tour de France, we can say, now let's make the comparisons and add that particular, particular puzzle piece to the whole picture. That's the, that's the point, is that, is that this is all start, it's part of a process, and I, I do believe that it's getting better. So I look, for instance, there's a guy, um, Vela Clinic on Twitter, who's a doctor in the States, and... He's, he's worked out a model based on historical climbing yeah, Mike, data. Mike Pukovic. Mike Pukovic is, is his name, yeah? It, yeah. And he's, he's worked out this model for a predicted VAM, which is the, doctor, the infamous Dr. Ferrari's method with vertical ascent meters, which is basically another unit of power output for those. It, it was not a unit of power. It was just a measure of climbing performance. And so he's looked at that from the, the known doped era and the supposedly cleaner era, and he's worked out predictions and where do we lie in relation to those. Imagine you could go back 15 years before that. Then, then you're starting to have some powerful data. At the moment, we're playing poker with half a deck of cards, and we don't know which half we didn't have, other than to say that we don't have enough historical data. So let's not concede defeat because of that. Let's work forward to say let's get it in the future. Yeah, I, I think that's a valid point. I think we, we, we need to have more data. Um, it, it's the same as the biological passport. I mean, the biological passport uh, works better the greater the amount of data is in that system. And I think the same would apply to, to power-based data and how to look about it. I, I've got my own ideas in terms of what I think would probably be an effective strategy. And, uh, you know, there, 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 there's discussion around releasing IP when you when you release power files. And I think... Those are things that you can avoid by, for instance, not necessarily giving the entire uh, power file in terms of what a rider did on a particular uh, training session. What you can do is you can have power profiling. So the whole critical power, to go back to that, the critical power uh, curve, uh, you know, you can have a, an average of that for every month of a rider's uh, uh, season. And, uh, and have those collected over uh, the course of the years and, and, and make comparisons on those. And that would give you a lot of insight into what an athlete is able to do for a particular period of time in a fresh state, so they do do performance in training and also race files. I think there's certainly not anything to be lost by, by sharing race data. I mean, you've either got the performance or you don't. If you do, you, you know, you're going to win. If you don't, you're going to lose. And... Um, how you happen to get there in terms of the training methods is is uh, is maybe IP you want to protect, but there's there's no harm done in releasing the race data. Um, that said, of course we've got to make sure that the, the the power meters are calibrated correctly. But I mean these days the technology is getting to the point where, you know, it'll be quite clear that uh, it's been done properly. I mean you can even check the the offsets and the and and those types of values on the file to make sure that you know the calibration was done correctly and that it's not some abnormal reading and obviously you can correlate that to the other riders performances compared to the predicted results so that it checks and balances all the way through and uh, I think long term we'll probably end up heading in that direction I don't know if you agree Ross yeah it's, it's really not that difficult people come up with many reasons why it can't work and none of them to me are particularly valid other than potentially cost that's yeah. the only thing but 
there's nothing there's nothing scientifically impossible about doing it and that's what we're saying is comparative longitudinal so it's two dimensions space and time time means one rider over many years Space means that rider compared to other riders, and then you can combine them and say, let's look at two different riders compared to one another over the years. And if we come back to, to Froome, obviously the big question mark is that is that 2011 change, right? Now, again, there we, we don't have a picture. We've got, we've got, to use the analogy, we've got an, a movie that is basically eight years long, and we've got two photographs at the beginning and at the end of it, and the plot twist happened in the middle. Now, if, if data existed, then we would be in a better position to say, oh, look, here's where something had changed. And that, that would be informative. I don't think you're ever worse off by knowing more. And that's the problem, is we don't know enough. And in, against that backdrop, if this was any other situation or any other era, we would not question it. Well, not, let me not say we. I wouldn't be as skeptical. But unfortunately, this is a sport that is uh, for 25 Heck, let's say a hundred years um, <laughs> been tainted by it, and so when we see transformations, we respond to them because we're responding to pattern recognition, not not data, and the data then informs the pattern recognition, not not the other way around, you know. So, so that's where I feel that there was that, that's where things are missing now. Did did the testing achieve what it set out to do? Partly, as Duran said, it responded to the call for by some people to make available VO two max, but. As any scientist listening to this will know, every finding that you come up with in research generates one, usually more than one question. And I felt that some of the questions it generated might have been addressed with even more transparency. Am I asking for too much? Maybe. But hey, welcome to professional sport. That's how, that's how it rolls these days, and sadly. Yeah, I think uh, you're right in terms of the, 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 there's still questions that need to be answered. I think the, the the catch is really, you know, obviously Chris has won the tour twice. Uh, that means he's in the spotlight to the to the greatest degree, and the, and the pressure is on him to produce, uh, you know, more and more data and be more and more transparent. And you know, I said in an interview before, he's done more than anyone else in terms of transparency. And I think in the, in cyclingnews.com uh, clinic forum, they've jumped on me and said, no, 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 he hasn't. Thibaut Pinot's done more, and and. Uh, uh, some have said, oh, well, that shows that uh, Dr. Swart's ignorant of, of cycling. So let me just put that into context for the, uh, for the Cycling News Clinic uh, Forum. Uh, what I meant was uh, he's done more than any other Tour de France winner, not necessarily any other cyclist. I'm sure there are cyclists who've, who've uh, put all of their data on Strava and have done more than Thibaut Pinot. So context, once again, is important. And um, so, you know, in terms of Tour winners, he's head and shoulders above anyone else in terms of transparency. <laughs> But, uh, you know, where does that take us in terms of what he should do and, 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 and what others should do? Certainly he's leading the way, and being the tour winner, he probably should lead the way. Uh, should it be done by the UCI, and, and should this be done, uh, you know, by a, a very clear objective process? I feel that's probably the more uh, reasonable one. Uh, some would say, okay, well, he's got to release all of his APP data and all of his power data into the public domain. I don't necessarily think that's responsible. I think there are too many uh, people that jump on that and, and, and will look for uh, evidence of doping. And, and it's confirmation bias that comes in there, cherry-picking little bits of data and then you know, screaming loudly that, look, here's the evidence. I think that's not necessarily, and I'm sure you'll agree, Ross, that, that there is that element of danger in that in terms of, you know, you le release that data and you get some vocal guys who, who have, and, and Antron Veyer is a, a prime example, gets a lot of press, and, and we've clearly shown in the, in the last week or two that his understanding of physiology isn't necessarily as, uh, as adept as, as uh, it should be. And, you know, that, that then creates a danger of giving somebody a platform to scream loudly that there's been... Uh, you know, some some uh, foul play when it may not be the case. And in the ABP, that's particularly pertinent. I mean, I sit on an ABP panel, and we review data, and, you know, the data sets that look wildly uh, out of whack, uh, to, to just use a euphemism, and, and, and suggest that there's foul play. And then when we go into greater detail and see when those data points happened, how they happened, we actually end up with quite a, a clear explanation for them and, and, and show that the athlete actually isn't doping and vice versa we see these very very clean looking passports and uh, and it turns out uh, in the end that you know the athletes been using all kinds of uh, illicit substances so um, it's a difficult one if you don't have the expertise to assess the data 
it, it's easy to come to conclusions that aren't necessarily valid. And, and that's where my worry is, you know. I, I, I think, uh, Ross, I think you sit on a, on a slightly different sort of uh, point in terms of that spectrum and maybe uh, feel that it should be released into the open domain. I was just, yeah, I was just going to ask, um, with sort of great influence and the scientific knowledge that you both have, comes a great deal of responsibility in trying to um, portray to um, the public, you know, a, a, an accurate picture of what it is we're seeing. And I think, Ross, do you think that, that sometimes drawing the parallels as people do between Chris Froome and Lance Armstrong, and particularly... Um, making the point about Chris Froome's improved performance between, you know, the early years in his professional career and winning the Tour de France for the first time, they end up being quite leading statements, don't they? Yeah, I'm sure, but that's that's fair enough. I mean, that, because the situation is leading. So you can appreciate why people would make those. As I said earlier, it's pattern recognition. It's not... It's not arriving on the scene and suddenly deciding you're going to pass judgment by making a comparison. It's by saying, you know what, we've, we've gone through this before. We've seen similar things in the past. So there are questions that need to be asked here. And that's, that's all it is. It's like saying that there are questions that have to be addressed. What's the alternative is to not make any comparisons and let history repeat itself, potentially. People don't want to do that. So a lot of the time when people ask those questions, they're not doing it because they want to be vindictive. They're doing it because they genuinely want to seek answers that give them some qualified hope. I mean, for me, that was definitely the case. Was Let's look at the power outputs post-biological passport, which was in 2006, I think, so from then onwards. And let's see whether the estimates suggest that the biological passport is doing what it purports to do, which is to reduce or eliminate doping. Because at the same time a study came out, and again, it's <laughs> those who are cynical will question the authorship because it was commissioned and done by people within the UCI, but it showed that there had been a shift in doping practice as a result of the biopassport, and that was judged by the nature of suspicious samples. In other words, we went from one extreme of doping, which was EPO, which was indicated by a high reticulocyte percentage. So that sort of tells you that athletes are using this drug. And all of a sudden, within literally overnight, when the biopassport was introduced, we went from high, high reticulocytes to extremely low, which suggests they changed the behavior to blood dope. Now, that happened in conjunction with a slight downturn in performance. And so that's a great picture because now you can start saying, you know what, actually, there's some hope here because we love the sport, we want to see the hope. But then what happened was the, the performances have turned back up. So now you're going to say, well, how, how has that happened? And, and can we explain that? And you're looking for answers to questions which are genuinely, sincerely motivated. They're not, it's not a witch hunt and it's not vindictive and it's not to say who's the next Lance Armstrong. It's to say, can we actually find someone who is clean? It, that, that was the purpose. And unfortunately, I, th I think emotion got into it and people, people started to ask questions with certain emotional biases, again, from both directions. And then, this, then the whole method and process unravels. And I've, I've been through a couple like this outside of cycling. We had Oscar Pistorius, who, if you're not into track and field, you'll know the name because he, he was subsequently became infamous for killing his girlfriend and he's now been convicted of murder. But it was the same story, like did this guy have an advantage or not? And there was a scientific question that had to be asked. That's not to say he was being judged for it, although based on everything we knew, I felt the answer was yes. And of course, here in South Africa, I was, I was <laughs> beaten up badly for that because people felt it was unpatriotic and unfair on the guy and don't get in the way of a story. The same thing happened with Casta Semenya, who was uh, accused of being a man, basically, and sh she'd won the world title in the in the 800 in 2009 and what that particular story taught me was that half transparency is the worst possible thing because what happened then was that it was released to the media that there was some evidence that there was something going on there but then they shut the doors they said no that's it we're not going to talk about this anymore because it's inappropriate to talk about someone's medical information because there are too many people in the lay public who don't have enough information and who aren't educated enough and it'll make it worse my position was that those people were jumping on nothing. In other words, they were going to say what they wanted to say anyway. Rather put the information out there and let them expose their own ignorance because there will be enough people on the other side who do have an informed opinion who will make 
a valid argument based on that data. And that's where that's where Jeroen and I, I guess, do differ a little bit. I'm not I'm not all for just chucking all the biological passport data out there randomly, but I, I do feel that if you've if you've created a question by releasing some data and you've got other data that supports your explanation, then play the card. Like with Paula Radcliffe as well, you know, you've got these allegations of, of blood passport irregularities. She says that she's got other blood data that will exonerate her because she can explain it. Well, then play the card. Same thing with Froome. Is, He's got this explanation of Bellasia, which is absolutely valid. I mean, we, we're both South Africans. We learn about Bellasia at school. I was scared to swim in, in water when I was a kid because we, we were so terrified of this disease. If he's got medical data or biopassport data showing how that disease affected his blood and can explain that performance transformation, then play the card. People will listen to it. Some won't. But some will, and, and it'll help you in the long run, I believe, to be more transparent and more open. So Bilhazia is a, is a parasite, a waterborne parasite carried by um, snails, and, and uh, it infects the, the body. Um, the, I think there's too much being uh, written into the whole um, uh, red blood cell story. We're not talking about uh, malaria here, in which case you'd see a lot more effect on, on red blood cells. Yes, it can affect red blood cells, but it more... More than that, it infects various organs in the body, including the bladder, and causes just a generalized fatigue. And that's the problem. And, and Ross and I, having done our, both our theses on, on, uh, on the nature of fatigue, um, it's some, often very difficult to extract a single variable out of, fatigue, uh, out of performance and say, you know, that's the, the reason for a performance or that's the reason for fatigue. So I think the Bohazia element definitely... Uh, you know, has uh, merit in terms of playing a role in terms of the changes in his performance. But you've got to look back and, and look at some other factors as well. So, I mean, the first thing, and this is the interesting thing, was I think more interesting than the 2015 data that we collected is this data from 2007 from the UCI. And actually, it's not from the UCI. So also there's been a lot of ba uh, back and forward on, on, on websites about, you know, the nature of the data. And, oh, it's from uh, Dr. Mario Zorzoli, who's got, you know, some... Uh, aspects that may, you know, uh, put shed some doubt on on the validity of his uh, results. Uh, the data wasn't from Mario Zozoli. It's from the Lausanne Olympic uh, Swiss Olympic uh, uh, Center. So the data was collected by scientists independent from cycling, done at the Swiss Olympic Center in Lausanne, and was sent to the UCI and to Mario Zozoli, who was there. So, you know, and, we, and those scientists have actually approached us and are looking to publish the data in tandem with us for, for the 2015 data. So if we look at that data, and I, I, at this point in time I have no reason to suspect any uh, of that data as being false data, and they haven't certainly voiced that opinion at all. Um, he certainly had the engine back then, so the talent was there, and I think that's the difference between um, uh, the, the data from Chris in terms of the past versus, for instance, Lance Armstrong, where we, we saw that his data from, you know, 1995-96, he had a really explosive engine, but he wasn't really a, uh, an athlete that had a physiological profile that made him a tour, uh, potential tour winner. In Chris's case, I think that's very different, and I'm sure that's probably the, one of the big reasons why Sky signed him. What happened is he, didn't, he wasn't able to deliver on that promise, and, and what caused that, that failure to to live up to that promise, you know, that, that's the question. And it, I think we'll probably find that it's a complex question. There's the Bohazia element, but then you also got to look at him in terms of his development. Uh, a few years before that, you know, he's a late uh, start cyclist, so, you know, he wasn't schooled in Belgium riding bikes from the age of nine and learning tactics and learning where to position himself in the field and, you know, uh, developing that engine from an early age. Um, so it probably took time to unmask that that uh, potential. You got to look at you know the time, kinds of rides that he did. I mean, when he was at Bala World, I remember him attacking off the front with crazy attacks. Um, you know, not really a controlled rider. And maybe Sky was able to teach him some element of tactical uh, riding. Uh, there's the weight issue, which we saw in the 2007. I did. I, I, you know, of course, the Esquire article. You know, the the final line there is, you know, he always had the engine and he just lost the fat. I mean, you know, that's from an interview that I did with Richard Moore. I mean, and everybody's jumped on that and said, oh, look, Dr. Swartz says that, you know, the fat's the answer and that's the only reason for his change in performance. It's a part of the equation. So, yes, he tends to carry a lot of fat centrally 
and that means that he looks really lean, even though his body fat percentage can be quite high. And we saw that in the test before the Vuelta. I mean, a guy who looks absolutely emaciated but has a body fat percentage of 10%, um, you know, it's deceptive. And he was certainly carrying more in the past. So the fat's a part of the equation. The Bohazi is a part of the equation. Tactics, experience, riding as a domestique initially, and, uh, and not necessarily riding specifically for a hard performance like he did in the Vuelta. You know, those are all kinds of factors. And so it's a really multifactorial process. And whether or not we can ever distill it down to one or two variables, we'll see. But uh, th- therein lies the danger. You know, you release all the, the power data and you don't have an answer for it or you can't give a concrete answer other than, you know, a, a, an explanation that... Uh, and, and my explanation is just sort of uh, a take on it. It's it's it might not get to the point where you can actually specifically get it to a single data set or a single variable that you you know. And we like to, as human beings, have that that finite uh, value to be able to validate something. I don't think we'll get there necessarily. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast, brought to you by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. Pair your power meter with over 800 workouts and 80 training plans to make you a faster cyclist. Visit trainerroad.com forward slash TCP to try Trainer Road risk-free for 30 days. Okay, we heard part one of the conversation there between Jeroen Swart and uh, Ross Tucker with Lionel chipping in. And the, 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 the thing we were talking about there, going to more subjects in part two, uh, about particularly around Team Sky and their PR um, failings or otherwise, but the, the thing that, we, that you were sort of teasing out them there a little bit, Lionel, was the role of scientists and the role of data and what it tells us. And Jeroen Swart asked a very good question. It's one thing to, to know the figures. It's another question to know what they mean. And on your discussion with them there, did you feel that you know we, we know now that a lot of the estimates are in power data and so on are, are are pretty accurate but do you feel that they are any further in knowing what they actually mean and and where that red line is if it exists i don't really i must admit i was quite surprised i've never spoken to ross tucker before i've seen him um very active on twitter uh the tone of his voice is quite different to the tone of his tweets which sometimes are pejorative um, inflammatory leading they, they are not things that I associate with science really I associate science with a kind of cool dispassionate detachment almost from the results and the, 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 the pursuit should be in um, finding out uh, the truth of a matter through scientific analysis and I know, I know I've been very critical in the past of the sort of back of a beer mat calculations taken with a stopwatch and and the Tour de France just on television it was really interesting to hear your own back that up and say that they're not that wildly out I mean you know they can be reasonably well estimated but I still don't know whether the this is helping in the debate of about whether an athlete is clean or dirty uh, performance is one factor as we'll hear a little bit in um, part two Um, it's not the only factor and I think that if we were to say right there's a red line where any performance above this particular line must be doped I think we are doing a disservice the problem is that there's so much baggage associated with cycling you know going back to well going back to the start of the sport really and and we now have we're just beginning to sort of scratch the surface of uh, in terms of our knowledge and understanding and you know, we now have one Tour de France winner whose data is kind of available and verified, and we're now trying to build a picture of an entire sport based on that one individual. And what I found most interesting about your own um, uh, comments in that first part there was him saying that if all of the data from races was made available, then riders c- would not be able to sort of complain that they're. Um, you know they're giving away a competitive advantage because as Daniel has often said on the podcast the scientific data is backed up by the race results in a lot of cases you know um, it stands to reason that the you know the rider who climbed out Duez quickest is putting out more power per kilo than the, than the next guy you know and so we could gain a lot more understanding it depends how heavy is <laughs> exactly yeah we could we could gain a lot more understanding by gathering that race in race data i still think that there's a 
that people will still clamour for more and more and more and then they'll want training data or people will say, well, what's he doing in training to get to that point? And I think that's the biggest misunderstanding with this whole process is that Chris Froome's lab results back up his Tour de France result because he's that athlete. What it doesn't answer is how he got there. And I think as we hear in part two, that's the biggest grey area now. And again, there's a lot, lot to be understood and misunderstood about that process of going from a rider. You know, everyone, everyone was once not very good at cycling and then very good at cycling. I mean, where do you start drawing the line? You, you say, well, a junior rider wasn't capable of winning the Tour de France. Well, no, of course they weren't. There has to be some progression. Right, Lion. I mean, Daniel, we've not actually heard anything from you on since the release of the, the Chris Froome data. I'm not going to ask you to... We, we've covered that quite a lot in the last couple of podcasts. Um, but you've made some good points in the past. I remember in the perk, you have made some good... No, no, seriously. If you, if, you, if you cast your mind back a long, long way, you made a very good point in, in our perk, in our Friends special on, on doping, about the... There is a lot of value in the input of sports scientists in terms of the, the, the analyses they can do, the, the, the conclusions they can, can draw, the inferences they can draw from that. They have a particular expertise what, and they have detachment from the sport. But what they don't have is what perhaps we have as, as journalists who are around the sport and speaking to people, that kind of context. I mean, where do you stand now on the usefulness or otherwise of this performance data as it relates to this bigger question of doping and, and, and whether athletes are credible or not? Um, I think to use a, a colloquial English expression, it does my head in this this debate and I'm just so weary of it and I think this is a good opportunity for everyone to ask, what is the ultimate purpose of for what's, what Chris Froome has done, what is the ultimate purpose of estimating power data, what is the ultimate purpose of finding out with exactitude um, how many watts someone has put out on a certain climb we are never ever going to be able to bring a case against an athlete on the basis of performance data however accurate it is um, in terms of anti-doping, so it is a complete blind alley as far as anti-doping is concerned, what is very useful for in terms of anti-doping is to identify macro trends and I think the UCI um, should be looking at this. I don't think Wilder we'll really have the either the budget or the jurisdiction to um, do this in cycling, but certainly the UCI can do it, where um, they take a a wide angle picture of the whole peloton at regular interview interviews, and from that they will be able to deduce whether there are new techniques, new methods, um, maybe have come into play, and and then they can target test people, and you know they could they could target test Chris Froome they could target um, any other rider who's had a a seemingly miraculous transformation Um, I I think the real question is what paradigm shift needs to take place in anti-doping for it to be more effective and I personally think that it needs to be more um, intelligence led I think um, the UCI needs to have more powers of investigation non-analytical investigation so you know we've seen Things like the Festina scandal, Operation Puerto, they've come about because of police action. You know, we need to look at that style of investigation, whether it's in countries that have anti-doping legislation or whether it's conducted by the UCI. But uh, in terms of prosecuting targeted, well, certainly prosecuting um, individual athletes and and saying with any degree of certainty whether they're doped or not, I think this has no value. Uh, just a final point about the the science and the rigor, I find that a lot of the people doing this analysis, including Ross Tucker and Euron Swat, are very, very rigorous in certain um, in certain respects on certain factors, certain parameters. However, they cannot possibly be rigorous on other factors. For example, you know, I've, I've read, I've seen speculation about Chris Froome's performance in the 2008 Tour de France. We don't know how well Chris Froome trained before the 2008 Tour de France. We don't know um, exactly what his weight is. People basing assumptions on what he said in interviews about what his weight was his um, psychological factors his mother had died uh, I think a, a month or two before the 2008 Tour de France uh, you know what bike was it what w- was um, his bike position properly dialed in before the 2008 Tour de France I mean if you're going to be rigorous you really need to be rigorous to that degree you know has anyone got transcripts of what was said in the Bala World bus every day in the 2008 World, um, World Cup 
Tour de France, World Cup of Cycling. Um, do we know exactly what the tactical directives were on every given day that Chris Froome wrote? No, so if we're going to be rigorous, let's be completely rigorous and let's all soon realise that it is impossible to be completely rigorous and it's impossible to have this perfectly pixelated view of exactly what went into every performance. And I, you know, I've cl- I clashed with Ross Tucker in, in 2013 because I felt that a lot of his commentary was leading. Uh, you asked him about making leading statements, and he said that was that was fair enough. Is it fair enough for a scientist? Is it is it how a scientist should be um, conducting himself? Frankly, I mean, I I think about it's maybe an extreme example, but some of the Richard Dawkins, a, a scientist. Who, whose message and whose um, thoughts I largely agree with. I don't ne- though like the, 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 the manner in which he expresses himself, the statements he makes, the fact that he maligns people and, and doesn't respect people. And, and I think that um, there, there's, a, a duty, there's a duty of a scientist or indeed a journalist to be, to be led by evidence and to be really f- focused. And, and as you say, Daniel, incredibly rigorous, rigorous and not selectively rigorous I also think you know, to give credit to people like Ross Tucker and Jeroen Swart and also the sort of amateur the fans who are trying to make these calculations um, make the calculation um, the, the, why has this come about? It's, be, it's come about because people felt betrayed for a long long time um, by Lance Armstrong, the, the Lance Armstrong generation, really they should feel betrayed by the whole, as Lionel said you know, every generation has gone before Lance Armstrong. But what has come of that? There is a desperation now to find out, to know with a huge degree of certainty what is actually happening. People don't trust um, dope tests, rightly so, because dope tests can't um, detect um, every kind of dope and they can't, we can't identify every cheat. So people are desperate to know, but they can't know. So what can they do from their living rooms? What can they do from their labs in Cape Town? They can look at performance and they can estimate some better than others. People like Ross Tucker and Euron Swart incredibly well. Um, but that is as good as they can... That is the best that they can possibly do. They can't be there in the anti-doping um, lab behind the finish line at the Tour de France. They can't be in Chris, hiding out in Chris Room's hedges or his dustbin um, or his bathroom cabinet. So this is the best they can do. So it's, it's understandable and it's a result of the democratisation of public discourse that they use things like twitter but this is as this is as close as they can get and they are still a million miles away from being able to see it with any clarity the actual reality of what's happening but we all have a responsibility scientists and journalists alike i think to be as impartial as possible um, as far, far as that's humanly possible um, and to be uh, to be fair and objective and on that note we should perhaps leave it at this point we'll come back later in the week with part two um, which is a continuation of the conversation between Jeroen Swart and Ross Tucker. So let's, let's come back with part two um, in a couple of days and we'll leave it there for just now. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thanks. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. You've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Thank you to Glass Pair for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.